Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and on those in the tombs bestowing life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Welcome, Father Sebastian. Thank you. It's good to be back. I apologize before we start here that I am uh, just finishing up a pretty bad cold slash flu. Uh, so my, uh, I'm in good health, but my voice sounds really bad. So uh, I won't be as, as loud and animated with my voice as I maybe am sometimes to keep you awake. But hopefully... The text itself will do that. 1 Corinthians is a pretty exciting text. A lot here. Let's talk a little bit about context, though, before we jump into it. You remember we started two weeks ago with our first talk on Acts the Apostles, chapters 1 through 15. It is so important. I cannot emphasize this enough. If all Christians in the world would simply sit down and read Acts the whole book, cover to cover. How long does that take you? Turn off the TV. Take you a couple hours, okay? The vast majority of heresies and schisms that plagued Christianity for 2,000 years would vaporize overnight. It's that powerful. Every major thing you can find that is dividing Christianity today, especially all the various divisions within Protestantism, all of those divisions just disappear, or at least the reasons for them would disappear if people would sit down and read Acts. You might say, well, why don't they? Well, look in the mirror. You might say, well, why haven't I? Right? How many people here tonight, let's be honest, I, you don't have to raise your hands, or we're here maybe in our first, our first talk or the second talk, had ever read through the book of Acts before this series? Or maybe had read it sometime years ago as it's some devotional reading through the Bible, kind of flew through it and just moved on. So what we need to do is we need to start looking at the book of Acts again. Why is it so important? All the other books are important, absolutely. But the book of Acts tells us the history of the early church. And you've got to know history. You've got to know your history to know who you are. Most Christians today do not know who they are. There are leaves on a big tree. Off this branch are these type these leaves, and off this branch are these leaves, and they look across the tree at each other and realize they're on different branches, and never the twain shall meet. But if they would look back down the branches, down the trunk, all the way down to the roots, into the apostolic church, they would realize why there are divisions in the branches and why those divisions shouldn't be there. So I encourage you very strongly to please take the book of Acts, very seriously. Read it, read it, and reread it. It is so rich and so important for us for so many reasons. For our series that we are finishing tonight, it's important for us to understand the historical context of the epistles of Paul, if we're going to understand them. We saw in Acts 1 through 15, the first major problem the church faced, the first heresy that the church faced, a heresy is an idea that causes division. What's called the Judaizer heresy, or the heresy of the circumcision party, as it's referred to in other places, the circumcision party, which went along with that, of course, the kosher laws. We can't cover that again tonight. I hope you did your homework and reviewed that, and I hope you read Galatians, and I hope you went back also and read Romans. And if you did that, you probably now have a completely new perspective on Paul. And I say that for a reason. Many Protestants today, it's, it's like wildfire in the evangelical world, are realizing what's called the new perspective on Paul. New meaning since Luther. 
if you've ever heard Scott Hahn's conversion story, you remember when he was in seminary at Gordon Conwell, while he was still a Protestant, he realized, along with other seminarians and other professors, that Luther was wrong on faith alone. The whole thing came from a misreading of Paul. And they, as Protestants, and very comfortable Protestants, came to the conclusion, as many Protestant scholars are today, they came to the conclusion that Luther was wrong on sola fide. That's today in the Protestant world called the new perspective on Paul. And it is spreading like wildfire because it's truth. And the truth is finally setting that aspect of our separated brethren free. Very important for you to help that along, light some local fires by studying that topic we already discussed. Okay. Tonight, we're going to look at something else, which we see all over the Pauline epistles as well. And we can't cover everything. There are so many different wonderful topics to discuss, but we, we are focusing in here on the two major heresies that the early church faced so that you, as you're reading through the Pauline epistles, or even the early Christian literature outside of the New Testament, say the letters of Ignatius of Antioch or something like that, you're going to understand, oh, maybe at least 90% of the material. There's a lot of other little sub-themes and issues that we can't get to tonight. But we did already cover the first big one, and the first one chronologically, and that is the Judaizer heresy. Critical to understand. Tonight, we're going to look at the dualist heresy. And in order to do that, we're going to be looking at the text of 1 Corinthians. But before we jump into that text, we need a little bit of background. Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthians on his third journey. Is Andy with us tonight or Angela? Are you? Yep. <laughs> did Andy hand you over those maps to pull up? He did. And okay. he said the third journey. Yeah. Why don't you pull up, first of all, the first journey to get our historical context and then one after the other. Okay. Okay. So you remember the first journey. Paul went from Antioch over there on the right from Syria down to Cyprus with Barnabas and Mark, John Mark with them. And they went up into Asia Minor. And then from Asia, in Asia Minor, he turned around. This was very important to notice. If you were in Derbe and you wanted to get back to Antioch or Tarsus, where would you go? Paul does not go home yet. Remember, he was chased out of every one of those cities. And he wanted to return to them. And he didn't want to leave them without clergy. We hear about that in chapter 14 of Acts. He eventually makes his way back to Antioch. And Angela, you can pull up number two there, journey number two. In his second journey, recall, after Acts 15, after the Declaration of the Council, as it says there, in order to deliver to the brethren the Declaration and to strengthen them, he went from Antioch into Asia Minor and stopped in Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, event and delivered to them the declarations. We've already talked about that Judaizer issue. He then went over to Troas. You see that? And he crossed the Aegean Sea and he began to found churches in Macedonia and then eventually down into Greece. That's Athens and Corinth. You remember that. This is in your reading of Acts. Hopefully you've seen some of that. Then after that, he, by boat, went home. Okay, so he founded the church in Corinth on his second journey. He was there for about a year and a half. So he knows this church well. They know him well, which means what happens if he knows the church well? It's been there for a year and a half. There's going to be some code language in the epistle that is not intended to be cryptic, but for us, because we weren't there for a year and a half being taught by Paul, we might need to unpack it a bit. So we're going to do that together. Then, after he returned from Corinth and went back to Palestine, he made his third journey. So on that, that second journey was right around 50 to 52. And then 
he left. Eventually, Apollos arrived. And then he eventually goes on his third journey. And Angela, you can go ahead and pull that up, his third journey. On his third journey, he traveled through Asia Minor again, I'm sure stopping to see mom for a gefilte fish sandwich in Tarsus. Then he goes through Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, probably stopped by to see them. He went into Ephesus. And when he was in Ephesus, right there in the center of the map, he wrote that letter back to the Galatian churches. Remember that? That's what we talked about last week. He wrote another letter at this time from Ephesus. And that's called First Corinthians. I want you to look at the map there where Ephesus is. And then I want you to look at where Corinth is. And you can see it's just across the Aegean Sea. When Paul was in Ephesus, he received a letter from a group of Christians in Corinth who were very concerned with what was happening to their church. It was divided into all sorts of factions. Some were still identifying themselves with Paul, holding fast to the hope that he might come back in a couple of years and solve the problems. Some are aligning themselves with Apollos. Now, Apollos and Paul were friends, but Apollos had arrived there after Paul. And some are identifying themselves more with Apollos than Paul, seeing maybe Apollos as maybe their, their new father in the faith or something. But after Apollos had left, there were some other Christians who had arrived, and these are the ones we we're going to have a problem with, who were teaching the church in Corinth not to listen to what Paul had taught them when he founded them. They began to teach them a new religion, a new version of Christianity, inundated with the dualist heresy. Okay? Now, before we get too far into that, I want to rewind a bit and look again at this map. I want you to look at Corinth for a second. If you look where Corinth is, you can see that it's on a land bridge between two seas. Corinth has two bays in a certain sense, and one on each side. It's on a little land bridge. And being on that land bridge, it has two ports, one on the Ionian, one on the other, okay? There are two bays. Corinth is on this little skinny land bridge. In fact, it's so skinny that they eventually, even back in Greek times, they tried to make a canal between the two seas. Because if you brought a boat in on one side, you'd like to go to the other. And during the time of Paul, they were already, even before Paul, picking boats up out of the water, putting them on wheels, and hauling them over to the other sea on land. And then they'd get back in the water and continue on. The Greeks tried to dig a canal. The Romans tried to dig a canal. Eventually, in modern day, our modern day, they finally finished the canal. Very thin piece of land. This is important to understand because Corinth is a complex city. Think of a port city in the ancient world. A port city is a city that has, is multicultural. It's not isolated up in the mountains. Every boat that comes in is bringing in its culture and its religion. Wealth and crime and whatever you want, you're going to find it in a port city. You've heard of, you know, the, the image or the, the story of sailors getting off the boat, right, into a city for a stay. Well, imagine a city that has a port on either side. Double your trouble, right? Double your wealth. Double your crime. Double your culture, your religious complexity, everything. Now, the city of Corinth is very ancient. It goes back into the ancient Greco, or to the ancient Greek world. It was during the time of the Roman Empire, to bring ourselves up to the time of Paul, one of the most important and wealthiest cities in the Roman Empire. One of the most influential. This is why during the Greco-Roman Empire, the Greeks and even the Romans were trying to dig that canal. Corinth was famous for its schools of rhetoric and philosophy 
rhetoric and philosophy. Corinth was also very wealthy, although you would have certainly had lots of uh, scales of that wealth, uh, the very poorest, of course, and of course, very wealthy in the city. Because they were famous for their schools of rhetoric and philosophy, and because they were very wealthy, they tended to have a pretty high regard for themselves. A citizen of Corinth was a very proud individual compared to one of the lesser cities of Greece. But the Greeks themselves were very proud because, hey, they were the Greeks. Even the Romans wanted to be like Greeks. You know, I would imagine, that the aristocracy in Rome, in the city of Rome, they didn't speak Latin. That was for the common people. They spoke Greek. You wanted your kids to be educated? You, you bought yourself a Greek slave, and you made sure that slave taught your kids Greek. It was like what French is and French culture in Europe over the last few centuries, although that has certainly faded in the last hundred years. So while Paul was in Ephesus, he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church. Why did he do that? Because while he was in Ephesus, around the same time he wrote that letter to the Galatians, a ship arrived in Ephesus from Corinth. And there was on that ship a woman named Chloe and some of her friends, part of the Pauline faction in Corinth. And they were telling Paul about the problems that were going on in that church. And they asked for Paul to come quickly and solve the problems. Okay, so again, he's on the other side of the Aegean. Paul would like to go there quickly. He'd love to have jumped in the boat with Chloe and, and his friends and gone across the Aegean and straightened things out there in Corinth, but he could not. He had some stuff still to do there in Ephesus. And besides, he wanted to go up into Macedonia and see the churches up there. And so instead of going straight to Corinth, he writes a letter to the church in Corinth to prepare them for his arrival and to hopefully straighten a few things out before he gets there, lest he have to come in, as we're going to see, and use a bit of a rod to straighten things out. That's the historical background to the epistle. Now let's jump into the epistle and take a look at it. He wrote this epistle sometime around 57. Okay, so he founded the church 50 to 52, somewhere in there. He was there for about a year and a half. After he left, Apollos arrived. After Apollos left, Paul arrived for Paul's second stay. But before he got there on his second stay, he wrote this letter to prepare them for his arrival. He's going to write that letter. Chloe and their friends are going to take the letter on a boat back to Corinth, and they're going to read it publicly at the church. This letter is, being, is Paul's expected to be heard by the whole community in the midst of a liturgical gathering, Eucharistic gathering, in the midst of the liturgy. And who's going to be present there? All the factions, of course, who are sitting in different parts of the room, vying for power. And Paul's enemies, these Christians who are now governing the church in Corinth in his absence and saying all sorts of horrible things about him and turning the church against him. So you've got in that background to read the epistle. Now let's jump into the epistle and look at some sample text that will help us understand what's going on. So this is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. Okay, so look at how Paul begins there. This is very different. The, what letters have Paul written so far? He's written First and Second Corinthians, which are very nice letters. There's no problem in Thessalonica. There's some questions about, you know, some issues. They didn't understand some things. So he had to clarify. First and Second Thessalonians are intended to clarify on a few issues that the Thessalonian church were confused about. 
Paul wrote that, those back when he was at Corinth the first time. Very nice letters, very happy letters. You've read Galatians now, and you've heard one of Paul's more angry letters. Well, the only other letters that are kind of like Galatians are First and Second Corinthians. First Corinthians, about the level of Galatians. Second Corinthians, he's really mad. We're not going to get into that one tonight. But you can already see the tension here in First Corinthians. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle. Is somebody wondering, Paul, about your apostleship? Yeah. Who called him? What's the nature of it? Yeah. And Paul, right off the bat, is very, very, very good at rhetoric. Paul is already undermining his opponent's argument in that first line. As we read the text, we're going to see that these opponents of his that are running the church in his absence are claiming more authority than Paul, and their authority, they claim, comes directly from Jerusalem. They were taught the faith by maybe Peter, maybe by James, John. Now, these are not Judaizers, okay? These guys that Paul's dealing with here are the exact opposite of the Judaizers. They seem to be claiming authority from Jerusalem. There's some hints at that. Whatever the case may be, their claim is that they were taught the faith by the apostles of Jesus, and so they outrank Paul. You know, you remember this. This is what we had to deal with in the Galatians, right? But these guys are teaching something very different, very, very different doctrine that they're teaching. In a certain sense, the argument they have begins in the same place. Paul, not really qualified to talk to you. Paul, he's not educated. He doesn't know anything. Besides, he's never coming back. He doesn't even care about you. That's the kind of stuff that they were saying to, to the community. Paul says, called by the will of God. So God shows me. Whether you like it or not, God shows me to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ. Jesus called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I give thanks to you, to God, always for you, because of the grace. Now, here's a classic Pauline epistle. You have a Thanksgiving section. I mentioned to you, you don't get a Thanksgiving section, 2 Corinthians and Galatians, where he's really mad. But here, he's not quite yet at the level he'll be in 2 Corinthians. So you get a Thanksgiving section. But always in Paul's Thanksgiving sections, they're not just wasted fluff. He'll already in there be building his argument. If you read the epistle very carefully, go back to the Thanksgiving section, you can see where Paul's going. I give thanks to God always for you because of the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus. When did that happen? When Paul was among them, right? When Paul founded them. That in every way you were already enriched in him, that's in Christ, with all speech and all knowledge. Speech and knowledge. Remember, they're they're prideful. You couldn't convince a Corinthian there's anyone smarter than them on earth. First of all, they're Greeks, okay? Two, they're from the greatest city in Greece. And second, they're famous in Greece for their schools of rhetoric and philosophy. Even as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you, past tense, when I was with you, so that you are not presently, you are not, you were not, obviously in a present, you were not up to the present point, you are not lacking anything, any spiritual gift. You've been given everything you needed back when I was there. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain, sustain you to the end. So there's the, that's the gospel, right? You've been baptized in Christ. You're a member of the Christ body. So we'll see later on. He'll talk about that. And now we, what are we as Christians? We await the second coming of Christ, his glorious return when he will raise our bodies from the dead and we will participate in his glorious resurrection. That is our hope. That is our hope. Okay, and he goes on. He says, verse 10, I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no dissensions among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people. This is the lady that got on the boat and brought a little letter. They brought a letter from the church in Corinth with questions for Paul. And Paul's read the letter. 
And now he's writing this letter in response. He said, it's been reported by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brethren. What I mean is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Kepha. That's Peter. But why are they saying they belong to Kepha? Peter never went to Corinth. So there is the possible hint at the origin of these individuals, that there's a group that is maybe coming from Jerusalem that are claiming Jerusalem authority, like the Judaizers were. But again, teaching something very different, as we're going to see. Or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that you were baptized in my name. Well, I, I did baptize also the house of Cephas. But anyway, look, let me get to the point here. That's one of my most favorite verses of the entire Pauline epistles. It shows you the historical context. If this thing was some sort of, you know, polished composition, pre-thought out, you wouldn't get that. You are hearing a real historical document in which Paul is, is sitting there waxing eloquently while somebody's scribbling as fast as they can down what he's saying. I could imagine the context. I'm thankful I baptized no one except Gaius and Crispus and Paul. Paul, Paul wait, Paul? What about the household of Stephanus? I was with you when we did that. Oh, that's right. Well, whatever. Oh, but, and there's no erasers. Okay, the guy's scribbling with his ink. He's writing down as fast as he can. And there's no, there's no eraser. And paper's expensive. So you just get a little explanation and move on. He says, beyond that, I do not know whether I baptize anyone else. Okay, let me get to the point. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, sometimes uh, Zwinglian Christians, anti-sacramental Christians, Baptists, things that will zero in on that. You see, Baptism isn't really important. What it means is preaching the gospel. This is a classic Semitic way of speaking. It's all over the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's talking about a hierarchy of importance. If Paul wasn't sent to, pre to baptize, then why did he baptize anyone? Paul realized he baptized so many, he can't remember how many he baptized at this point. So I don't remember who else I baptized. Okay, let's move on. He was sent to preach the gospel first and foremost, secondarily to baptize. Otherwise, right, you don't have anyone to baptize unless you preach the gospel. Right? So you see how it works? You, you cannot separate the preach the gospel from baptism. But there is certainly a hierarchy, an order. Think of Philip preaching to the eunuch on the chariot. Right? After he preached the gospel, then he baptized. Right? Okay. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, fancy talking, eloquent rhetoric, wisdom, philosophy, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So why did he just say that? Because one of the accusations against him by the church in Corinth is that Paul's just not quite qualified to be their, their leader. He's not educated. He doesn't know any philosophy. He doesn't know any rhetoric. He's not from Corinth. How could he be as smart as we are? People who are over the church in Corinth right now are telling them that they're smarter than Paul. They're trained in rhetoric and philosophy. They're perfect match for these guys. Paul is a nobody. He's from Tarsus. Well, Tarsus was also famous for its schools of rhetoric and philosophy. Not as famous as Corinth. But Paul was trained in Greek philosophy and rhetoric, but he chose not to use those tools when he preached the gospel there. But he does use them in this epistle to put an end to the argument. As you, as you already have seen, this is one of Paul's most complex epistles. But he's worried. He says, I didn't come preaching to you when I came on that first trip. I didn't preach to you the gospel with eloquent wisdom, with philosophy and rhetoric lest the cross be emptied of its power. Why not? What, what does he mean? Well, here's what he means. See, look, for the word of the cross is folly, foolishness, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, 
and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. So fancy talkers, fancy thinkers, you've already been outsmarted and outtalked by God and by our gospel. And let me explain to you why. He'll say, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age, the rhetorician? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Whoa, I got to read that like five times. Yeah, Paul is a highly trained in rhetoric. Okay, now he's showing, he's showing him what he's got. He said, look, earthly wisdom and rhetoric, irrelevant. Because God did not use earthly wisdom and, irrelevant, and, and rhetoric to reveal his son. Otherwise, you would be saved, you Corinthians, more than anyone. Because who's smarter and better talkers than you are? That's not how the gospel came to you. That's not how salvation came to you. He says, for the Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Why? For the Jews, the fact that Jesus died was a major stumbling block. The answer that the apostles would give was, well, but he was raised from the dead. Oh, really? Interesting. Jews believed in resurrection, except for the Sadducees. But the vast majority of Jews believed in resurrection. So once you should, yeah, the Messiah, he died. No, really? I thought the Messiah was supposed to remain forever. Well, he does, but they killed him, and God raised him from the dead. Oh, interesting. Sign me up. But the answer for the Jew to the problem of the crucifixion was the stumbling block for the Gentile, as we're going to talk about tonight, because the Gentiles were dualists. They not only didn't believe in resurrection, they thought the idea was insane. And so preaching the gospel to Jews and Gentiles was very difficult. The Jews would stumble the fact that he died, which for a Gentile was kind of nice. Oh, you die. And once you die, you go fly off in your spirit off to the good gods again. We'll talk about that in a second. But then the answer was, no, 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 he, but he was he raised from the dead. What? And, and then the Gentiles would begin to laugh. Who would be raised from the dead? How ridiculous. Why would you want to do that? We'll get into that in a second. So he says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews or Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Is God weak? Is God foolish? No, you got to follow his rhetoric. This is some fancy talk in here. The fact that Christ died and rose from the dead is called foolishness and weakness. right? For the Jews, the fact that Christ died shows his weakness, so he can't be the Messiah. The fact that he rose from the dead is completely foolishness for a, for a Gentile. He says the death and resurrection of Jesus which they call foolishness and weakness, is stronger than anything any man has and wiser than the wisdom of men. You see how it works? Again, is it, I'm going to have to read this five times. Yeah, Paul's writing this as a rhetorician to a bunch of people who are well-educated in rhetoric. Chapter 2. When I came to you, brethren, chapter 2, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words of wisdom. I didn't come talking fancy and thinking fancy. All right, I'm putting American English here. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So it's all happened. When Paul showed up, Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead. But why? He was crucified, he was raised from the dead. But why? He was crucified. He's raised. He just kept telling them that now obviously it's a little more complicated than that. But he didn't get into long, complex arguments with them like what we're seeing here. He preached the gospel in very simple terms to them, as if he was speaking to uneducated individuals. He preached the gospel, but he didn't use fancy philosophy and, and fancy rhetoric. Why did he avoid using those tools that he had in his holster? Right? Why did he not use those tools, which he's now showing he's got? 
because he was worried that the cross, the gospel, would be emptied of its power in that church if he did. How's that? Look what he says. He says, and I was with you in weakness and much fear and trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. So I wasn't speaking eloquently there when I was with you, but rather in demonstrations of the spirit and power. What does he mean? Well, as you read the rest of the epistle in the second Corinthians, as you see in Acts, when Paul goes to these places, he raises people from the dead. Paul heals people. People touch stuff to Paul, a, a cloth touched to Paul, and they run off and touch somebody who's sick, and they're healed. It's like the power you see with Peter and his shadow in Acts. Now, that can't be duplicated. But fancy talk and fancy think surely can. So he says, the Corinthian church witnessed the gospel in power, in a power that cannot be duplicated by someone who might come later as an enemy of the gospel. They might be talking fancy and thinking fancy, but they cannot do what Paul did because they're imitation. They're false apostles. So he says, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but the power of God. That's why he did it. But now, since that part's over, you want to see my rhetoric and philosophy? So now you see him putting, 1 Corinthians is, like I said, probably, along with 2 Corinthians, Paul's most complex epistles from a literary standpoint. You have to read them a hundred times to be able to scratch the surface of what he's talking about. You got to really slow down and read these things. Again, he's writing these for people who are trained in this stuff. Now, in chapter three, we get again into the context there. But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh. So he says, we do have in the church, we have our Christian rhetoric and philosophy. And what does he mean by that? He means Jesus. Jesus is the, the philosophy of God. Jesus is the rhetoric of God. Jesus is what they've already received and Paul revealed to them. So why does he have to say that? Because the church in Corinth is seeking secret information. As you read through Paul's epistles that are written to Gentiles, facing the dualist heresy. There's another part of the dualist heresy that is almost inseparable, and that's called Gnosticism. And so before we get on too much further, I'll conclude this half of our lecture tonight with a little summary of dualism, dualistic Gnosticism. And then when we come back from our break, we'll see examples of that. In the ancient world, in the ancient Mediterranean world, in this region, there was what became a problem for the early church called Gnostic dualism. While a Jew coming into the church brought in, in with him two bags, circumcision and kosher laws. And he was told to leave those bags at the door, which they never did, of course. The Gentile, when they came to the church, brought in two different bags as well, Gnosticism and dualism. Gnosticism and dualism were two strong influences in the religious world of the Mediterranean at that time, especially this area and over in uh, the eastern area, eastern Mediterranean. The Gnostic aspect was this. The, in those cultures and in those cults and the, and the different religions of the time, there was a belief there was secret knowledge that you had to have in order to be saved. And you would learn these secrets, these little secrets, those incantations, secret words. And these little things you would memorize would be almost like little magic formulas that would save you when you died. Okay? Now, how would you learn these little secrets? The different cults, all the different pagan cults had their secrets. And they would entice you into their cult and hope you'd sacrifice and give them money and things like that. And they would tell you the secret of the cult. But not all of them. They'd tell you some of them. You want another one? you got to come back next week and donate a little more money, offer some more sacrifice, and sign up. 
And you'd move in various degrees into the cult. And every time you're given another little secret. If you know anything about the Masons, very similar. The other aspect of the religious landscape at the time was called dualism. And again, these go hand in hand. What do you mean you'd be saved at the end of your life by having these little secret incantations? Salvation for a Gentile in this region at this time, for the most part, can be summarized in this way. And there's lots of variations of this. But in general, it was this. The universe that we know, the cosmos, everything was created by two gods or two groups of gods. There were the good gods and the bad gods. The good gods are the spiritual gods who gave birth to you. Human beings are the spiritual children of the good gods. But the bad gods didn't like the good gods. And so they didn't like you either. And so they created a plan to destroy you. They created bodies in which they could catch these little spirit children floating around in space. And those bodies weigh you down. It's like a little prison cell. And the earth they created as a place for you to be imprisoned. So that the earth, the physical earth is a massive, massive Alcatraz. And your body is your individual cell in the prison. And salvation for you is to go back to your spirit parents. If you know anything about Mormonism, of course, you've probably heard some of these ideas too. So salvation for an individual in this region, by the way, this is again, this is called dualism. You find this in the very similar types of ideas in far Eastern religion. Among the Asian pagan religions, you see this. In fact, most scholars think this is where it came and how it got to the Mediterranean. The yin and the yang, the light and the dark. If you ever seen Star Wars, George Lucas was into this stuff. All right, so salvation for you was death, okay? The beginning of your salvation was death. He said, why? Well, because your body has to be shattered, destroyed, so that you can be set free. And so when you die and your body falls apart on the earth, your spirit can escape your body and this earth and float back up into the space and go back to your parent children or your, your God parents. All right. Now, how can you be freed at the moment of death from this material world to go back to the spiritual world? Well, you got to do certain things to weaken your body while you're still alive. You don't eat meat because that adds flesh to flesh. Okay? You don't want to strengthen your body. Your body's evil. So if you eat meat, you're going to just add flesh to flesh, which is bad, bad, bad. Okay? So you, you're typically, if you're a, a, a serious dualist, you avoid meat. You also avoid wine because wine causes the emotions to take control of you. And they associate the emotions, the emotions with the body. So they often would avoid wine as well. And they also would avoid sexual relations because, again, they saw all of these things as feeding the body, strengthening the body. And their fear was that at the moment of death, if the spirit can't get out of the body, then your spirit will be trapped forever on earth with the bad gods. Okay? So then, resurrection from the dead was the last thing on earth you would ever want as a dualist. You can see why when Paul was in Athens and he mentioned that Jesus was raised from the dead, this is in Acts of the Apostles, they laughed him out, laughed him out of the stadium. This is why we're going to see in 1 Corinthians, Paul having to deal with the issues of wine and meat and sexual relations and also the resurrection of the body. He'll do that in chapter 15. Okay? So that's a little background of what the average Gentile would have had in their mind when they came to the church in Corinth. Gnosticism, 
secret information. You got to have this to be saved. And then also, you've got to weaken your body, even now in this life, through certain things you would do or avoid in order to be freed at the moment of death to float back up to see your spirit parents. I think it's a good spot to take our break. Thank you, Father Sebastian. Thank you, Angela. I'm going to say this and everybody comes back too, but this text, come on, Kathleen, a text. Without a context is no text at all. You can't read this stuff without the context. This is why we, the title, Acts of the Apostles, He to St. Paul, is if we understand the background and the context of what he's saying, then we're going to be able to understand it properly rather than, rather than the opposite, which is taking a verse out of context and using it to prove a preconceived theological notion. Bad idea. Okay, that's, that's biblical suicide, biblical roulette or something like that, okay? Eventually, you're going to die if you do that. Not a good idea. So, this is, look, this is all over the place. Just look real quick with me. Look over at the epistles of John. And look, where is John, where is John living? The same area, right? He's in, he's in Ephesus and that whole area. And what's he dealing with? Look at 2 John 1, seven. Look at verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out in the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such one is the deceiver and the antichrist. So you see, look, what you're getting here with, with this is, is more than just key to St. Paul. It's key to the entire deal, what's going on. If, if you can say who, what, why, where, and when, you're going to have the key to be able to read these texts. But when you mm-hmm. rip them out of their context and you start battling with Protestants or whoever else, beating each other over the head regarding the Eucharist or baptism or whatever you want, or the papacy or whatever, and we keep beating each other over the head with one verse, stop it. Just stop it enough already. The tools are in your tool belt. Don't get sucked into a battle where you're shooting verses at each other. Sit down calmly and, and start to teach the background. Okay, a text without a context is no text at all father sebastian you're nailing it it's excellent uh we really appreciate these insights so it's all yours all right thank you and uh and again just to this would be a wonderful thing for you guys to do after after our talk tonight as part of your homework is not just to go back and read first corinthians but go back and read the Joan nine literature go back and read the gospel of john and those epistles of john's my brother was mentioned and you're going to see what's going on there in the later New Testament literature, you, you see this emphasis over and over on the body, the flesh of Jesus. Think of the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Think of the end. I don't believe he's raised from the dead. All right, look here. Check out my hands, my side. Jesus appears in the flesh, right? This is emphasized there in John's literature. John's writing toward the end of the first century when the vast majority of the Judaizing heresy has faded. And now the major problem as Gentiles are flooding into the church in droves is this problem about the flesh and the resurrection. We also have, by the way, in our library, a series on the apostolic fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp, the disciples of John and these guys, and they're, they're dealing with the same issue. So you go, if you want to look at the next generation that continues to fight this, this problem, it's, it's all there. Uh, again, it's the key that unlocks the, the whole business. So sorry, Father, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so... Chapter 3, he says, look, you want secrets? You want wisdom? I've got it for you. Come here. Let me tell you the secrets. Oh, 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 really? You you didn't tell us everything, Paul? No, I didn't tell you everything. Well, where are these secrets then? Jesus. Oh, you already told me that. Yeah, but nobody else knows about Jesus. Oh, Jesus is risen from the dead. Yeah, but we already knew that, Paul. Yeah, but nobody else knows. Oh, now go tell everyone. So this is appealing to that that secret idea, that Gnosticism. Okay, so he's not teaching them Gnosticism, but he's telling us, look, you're you're yearning for secret information. You've already got the secret information. Okay, now go out and spread the word, so it's no longer a secret. You have information nobody ever, oh, nobody else has. Corinthians, it's Jesus. So there's, you'll see over and over, you're talking about Jesus is the fullness of the wisdom, the fullness of the mystery. He, that's anti-Gnosticism there. 
Show them they've already got it all. Don't let anyone say, Psst, come here, I'll teach you some secrets in our cult. You don't need their nonsense. You've already got all the secrets, all the mysteries. You've already got it all. Jesus is the mystery of God revealed. All right. Chapter three. But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh. Oh, you think they like that? Men of the flesh. Mm. Babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready when he first went there. Right? He says, for you are still of the flesh. Now, he keeps talking about of the flesh. Paul's not a dualist like they are. Paul is a Christian dualist. Now, hold on. You got to understand what I mean there. When you listen to Paul, you're going to hear him sound almost like a dualist. Sometimes what he's doing is he's playing off of their dualistic ideas. And he's using it to his advantage to forward his message. Remember for Paul, when you are baptized into Christ, you come out of the baptismal font as a composite being. You are now spiritually raised from the dead, but you're awaiting your bodily resurrection. And until the bodily resurrection, there's a little bit of a war inside you. Your spirit is constantly telling you the right thing to do, and your body's constantly wanting to do the things it used to do. We call it concupiscence in theology. But Paul doesn't use that word. What he means is he talks about this kind of war, this internal war, which will be resolved for Paul, for everyone when we're raised from the dead. And our bodies are, are then united to our spirit again in perfect harmony. But between the baptismal font, our first resurrection, and the second in Christ, our second resurrection, our bodily resurrection, then, is a little bit of an internal war. But Paul does not mean the flesh is evil. It just needs to be controlled and directed by the spirit. For a dualist, the flesh is evil and the spirit is good. For a dualist, a pagan dualist, the flesh needs to be gotten rid of. Not in the Judeo-Christian tradition. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, God made the spiritual world, the physical world. He made everything, and it was very good. Therefore, all of it is in need of restoration, not rejection or destruction. Okay, to show you how relevant this is for you guys, not just for this epistle, but the reading the literature of John, but also even today. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but I'm, I'm going to present a little problem. If I were to ask you right now, and you could test this on somebody outside of this seminar afterwards, what would happen when you die? Well, I would imagine many people, though not ICC, individuals who are highly educated, but many people, many Christians would say this, when I die, my body will be buried in the ground, or maybe someone say burn, or who knows what they're going to do with their body. Okay. They say, well, what will happen to you? Well, I'll, I'm going to go up, float up to the pearly gates. Oh. Now, if they're a Catholic, they might say, well, I have to stop off in purgatory for 10,000 years. But whatever the case may be, whether you're a Baptist or a Catholic or what, they're going to end up in the same spot, stand at the pearly gates. And then, you know, they might give you some scenario of Peter, who knows what they'll do. But eventually, you say, what's going to happen then? I'll eventually get in. To where? To heaven. Oh, where's heaven? It's up there. Okay, and what are you going to do when you're there? Well, I don't know. I always want to pick up a musical instrument, maybe the harp. Uh, and, 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 and then what? I'll play, and I'll, I'll play beautifully, I'm sure. And, and then what? Well, I, I mean, I don't know. They'll give me a seat in the choir. I, what do you mean, what next? What? What's, what? Well, what happens next? There is no next. I'm in heaven. What are you going to be doing? Playing the songs? Singing? What kind of songs? I don't know. I always like Handel's Messiah, Hallelujah Chorus. Okay, and then what? Why do you keep saying that? Then what? There is no, look, don't you understand? Heaven's forever, man. That's heresy. But that represents the mind of 99% of Christians today. That's heresy. That's not the end. You may die before Christ returns. 
And in spirit, you may go to be in the heavenly spiritual realm to be with Jesus. Paul talks about this in the Philippians and also in the Corinthians. But that's not your permanent state. That's a temporary state. Until Christ returns and brings the spirits, the souls of those who have died, as he says in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, with him to the earth again, he raises their bodies, and he puts their spirits back in their bodies, and everyone's judged, standing there with their bodies, and then the wicked go off to with their bodies to eternal fire, to a lake of eternal fire with Satan and his demons. And the righteous, with their bodies, enter into the new heaven and earth with their bodies, because we have gravity. This is described at the end of the book of Revelation. And it's described like the Garden of Eden, like the New Jerusalem. And there we will be for all eternity with God, because that was his plan from the beginning, and his plan will not be thwarted. Salvation is not complete until you are raised from the dead and you're back in the Garden of Eden with God. Anything else is heresy. But tragically, 99% of Christians today are heretics. And I mean that in a nice way. People don't really know or realize this. But that is, that's why the gospel is not spreading anymore. We're not preaching the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus was raised from the dead, and you can be too. That's the good news that the world out there needs to hear. But Christians today don't even know the good news. More on that in another lecture. This is a problem, not only today, but all the way back to Paul's preaching to the church in Corinth, who were also dualists and did not believe in the resurrection of the dead, did not believe in the goodness of the body, but rather saw it as evil and to be destroyed and to be escaped from. All right, so with that in mind then, remember there are three major stages in the church in Corinth. Paul came, founded it, then Apollos, then after Apollos, this other group of leaders are there. So Paul says, chapter 3, verse 3, For you are still in the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh? Are you not acting according to your unregenerated bodies? as opposed to your spirit, right? Are you, what are you letting lead you in your life? You're acting like ordinary, unbaptized men, who, as if you didn't have the spirit of God or the wisdom of God. Now, for a dualist to hear this, that you're still in the flesh, oh, they wouldn't like that, right? He's using that against them. He says, verse 4, For when one says, I belong to Paul, or another, I belong to Apollos, are you not just merely men? Right? You're, even though you have the Spirit of God within you, you're not acting in that way. You're acting like ordinary men who just fight and disagree. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Not those guys are there right now. Notice, but God gave the growth. <laughs> they didn't do it. I planted, Apollos watered. God caused the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are equal. Each shall receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Notice he leaves out of that scenario the current hierarchy of Corinth. According to the commission of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And look at this. And another man is building upon it. And he better be careful what he does. So you get this warning from Paul here that the guys who are in charge, they better be careful what they do with his church. Because Paul's coming back and there's going to be trouble. He goes on, he says, in chapter 4, verse 14. Chapter 4, verse 14. I do not write this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, even at the present time, you do not have many fathers. So here's another spot where Paul can show that he outranks these guys. He's the founder of that community. He's their father. He says, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me. 
not of them, right? Therefore, I sent you to, to you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child of the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. And I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant. This is the group that's opposing him. As though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon. If the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk, not the rhetoric of those, these arrogant people. But of their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love? The spirit of gentleness, make a choice because I'm on my way. So this is a warning. First Corinthians is intended to clean up the place before he gets there. Eliminate some of the problems. But also it's a warning to them. That he is coming. He's just on the other side of the Aegean and he's going up to Macedonia and he's coming back to Corinth. All right. As we read the rest of chapter 5 and 6, we see Paul then talking about some of the other signs that the community is not healthy under its current governance. They're fighting among each other. They're going to court against each other. And these are all signs, Paul says, that you're still in the flesh, acting like ordinary men. That's the kind of thing you can really get under their skin, right? In chapter 7, he says in verse 12, quote, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. Now look at the quotation marks there. You pay close attention to that. When you see quotation marks, that means you're looking at a snippet from the letter from Chloe. These are sayings that Paul's opponents are saying. And Chloe's people, they've written this in the letter. They're saying this, Paul, and they're saying this, and they sent it to Paul. He's looking at this. He's looking at what they're saying, and he addresses what they said. He says, so look, they're saying, his opponents are saying, all things are lawful for me. Right? Didn't Paul come and say that the Torah is no longer in effect? Yeah. Well, what's the Torah? Law. There's no rules. Do what you want. That's not what he, that's not what he meant. He meant no circumcision and kosher laws. But for them, he said, no law at all. You can do whatever you want. This is what the opponents are saying. And then food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. See, these are quotes from his opponents. So what, what does Paul say? Look at his rhetoric. All things are lawful for me, you say. But I say, not all things are helpful. Oh, yeah, that's right. True. All things are lawful for me, you say. But I say, I will not be enslaved by anything. Do you want to be enslaved? No. You say food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Right? You can eat anything you want. And I say God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, what's he talking about? As you read First Corinthians, you hear there's a problem. The community, the community, they're going to the prostitutes in Corinth. What? Why would they do that? Because they're dualists. The dualist sect had two versions of it. One was no sexual relations whatsoever. If you were married, no relations with your wife. Think of Buddha, right? He was married with kids. He ran off from the, to the jungle to sit under a tree and stare at his belly button. Right? He abandoned his family. But the other option among dualists was to show that you did not regard your body at all was to engage in sexual relations constantly, constant orgies. One faction on the duelist would say no wine because it strengthens your body. Other factions said you drink all day long, drunken orgies, because it proves that you disregard your body. Some would avoid meat and other types of food. Others were gluttons, stuffing themselves constantly. So both of them are the same heresy, but the way they kind of lived it out, obviously, were starkly different. So the dualists were teaching, these Christian dualists that are governing the church were teaching the Corinthians something that appealed to them. You can go and eat whatever you want. You want to go eat the food offered to idols at the local temple? 
Go ahead. Your body doesn't mean anything. You're never gonna, you're not gonna have that in eternity. Oh yeah. You want to go back to the temple of Aphrodite and see Delilah? Oh yeah. Well, go for it. Because your body doesn't mean anything. You can do whatever you want in your body. It doesn't affect your spirit. By the way, you get some of this in Luther. Some of this in Luther as well. I don't know if you ever heard Luther's argument. You know, if, if you believe your salvation is based on how you live your life, then go find a couple of prostitutes and get drunk. Because then you'll realize there's no way you can be saved by how you've lived. And that'll prove to yourself that you're not saved by how, what you live, but what you believe. Dualism is a problem from the ancient world and still, as we already talked about, even until today. All right. So he says, he says, verse uh, 14, he says, God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? You know, why does he have to say this to the Corinthians? Because they're dualists. The cult of Aphrodite, it had cult prostitutes all over the place. What else do you have to deal with? Well, remember, there's the other type of dualism. Avoid sexual relations. Paul, when he showed up, didn't have a wife. So the question is, maybe Paul's that kind of dualist. So he spends all of chapter 7 explaining that Christian marriage is a good thing. Well, Christian celibacy is of a higher order. Christian marriage is good. So he talks about the hierarchy of goods here. For a dualist, marriage was evil. Sexual relations were evil. Paul says, no, no, no. It is good to be married. And if you're married, it's good to have sexual relations with your wife. But he says, but if you're not married and you don't feel a calling to that, then it's good to, hey, I could use some, some assistance in my missionary work. Right? The, the celibates in the early church were missionaries. The married clergy and the, and the lady, they tended to stay in one place. And you know, families know, know the issues. Right? You got kids, you got whatever. You, so Paul traveled constantly because he didn't have a wife and kids. So he shows that marriage is good, but, the, but Christian celibacy, that is the choice of a higher good, that is not getting married for the more efficient missionary proclamation of the gospel is of a higher order. But he's showing that you don't reject marriage or sexual relations within marriage as if they're evil. No, no, no. Again, tragically, though, today, a lot of Christians, especially a lot of even Catholics, will think of celibacy and marriage in these terms. This is why, ask a Baptist what they think about Catholic celibacy. You'll get a dualistic answer. Where are they getting that? Well, from the average Catholic they're talking from, too. Okay, so we, there's a lot of reasons why this is an important study for us tonight. Okay, chapter 8, look what he says. Now, concerning food offered to idols. Now, we're, I think we talked about this last time, but just a, a quick note on this. Food offered to idols. In the ancient world, in that region, there was no Denny's and McDonald's. If you were hungry, you had two ways to get food. Go to the marketplace, the local farmer, farmer's market, and you bought meat and vegetables. You took them home and cooked them. If you didn't want to do that, you went to the local temple of Zeus or Venus or whatever. The temples had a surplus of, of meat and bread and wine. It was constantly being donated by farmers and vintners. And so if you were a city dweller in Corinth, and you want to worship Zeus, what do you have to offer to Zeus? Money. So you went to the temple of Zeus, sat down at a table, and the servants of the priest would bring you some meat that was sacrificed that day, barbecued nicely, and then they'd bring you a jug of wine, some bread, whatever was, sac- was offered that day by the local farmers and vintners and things. Well, but that food has an offer to an idol. But the People who were in charge of the church in Corinth were teaching, hey, that's okay. That's okay because what you do is your body doesn't matter. Go to the temple of Zeus. Come on. Not going to hurt you. Just meat. Didn't Paul say all things are lawful? Oh, yeah. I mean, isn't the stomach made for food? Yeah. And the food made for stomach? Yeah. Well, then come on. 
What did Paul say? He couldn't eat? Well, I guess not. Okay. So look what he says in chapter 8. Now concerning food offered to idols, this is something that they wrote about in the letter to him. We know that, quote, all of us possess knowledge. Right? There's a quote. One of their, their sayings, one of their slogans, he says, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. You know appealing to their little Gnosticism issues, aren't right? But if one loves God, one is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that, as you all have been saying, quote, an idol has no real existence. There's only one God, right? Why can't you go to the temple? Zeus doesn't even exist. Come on, let's see. They got prime rib tonight. Paul then shows them the problem with their argument. Verse 7. Not all possess this knowledge that Zeus doesn't exist. But some, through being hitherto accustomed to idols, eat food as really offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we, if we do not eat or better if we do. So eating food isn't going to change your, your status in front of God. No, that's, tr that's true. He says, only take care of lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. For if anyone sees you, a man of knowledge, right? A Corinthian is saying, I know Zeus doesn't exist, so I can go to the temple of Zeus with a clear conscience, and eat the prime rib tonight, because it's good stuff. He says, look, you, a man of knowledge, what if someone who's weak, not so smart, sees you, a man of knowledge, going to the temple of Zeus tonight? He says, only take care, lest this liberty of yours become a stumbling block for the weak. If anyone sees you, a man of knowledge, at a table in an idol's temple, might he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food, Offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak man is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. So he's look, you Corinthians, I know you're so smart. And now, is there anyone not as smart as you? Oh, yeah. Okay, now let's say you're in Temple of Zeus. Is it possible that another Christian could walk down the street, see you at, at the Temple of Zeus eating at table, who's not as bright as you are? Because you know not everyone's as smart as you. Oh, yeah, I know that. And then they'll think that it's okay to eat the meat offered to an idol and actually worship the false god because they don't know what's in your head. Well, yeah, I suppose because no one's as smart as me. Okay, so then you see the problem? Not everyone's as smart as you. Oh, yeah. So again, he's using, he's using their own weaknesses against them here, right? So every Corinthian would think they're the smartest man on the face of the earth. And so every Corinthian thinks he can go in the temple of Zeus and eat meat off for an idol because he knows Zeus doesn't exist. But every Corinthian also thinks, since he's the smartest man on earth, that every other Christian around him isn't as smart as him. And so it's possible that one of his fellow Christians could fall back into polytheism by seeing him give what looks like a bad example. And so he says, thus, sinning against your brethren, wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of my brothers, well, I'll never eat meat again. All right, he brings this up again in chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 23, he says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. He's going to deal with this again. A little context here in chapter 10. He makes another argument of why they can't go to the temple of Zeus. Right? What Paul just did was appeal to their good nature that, hey, out of charity, Maybe you shouldn't be so concerned about eating the, the meat at the Temple of Zeus. Okay? Think about your brother who might fall back into polytheism by being confused by your example. So he, right off the bat, he eliminates their argument for going to the Temple of Zeus. But now he gives a more important one here. In chapter 10, he says, I want you to know, brother, let me tell you a story about our ancestors. They were all under the cloud. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all ate, drank supernatural food, right? The man and the quail flesh, the water from the rock. Yeah, yeah, we know that story, Paul. We remember you told us when you were, we were here. Yeah, okay. But do you remember what happened to them? After God brought them out of Egypt and 
baptized them into Moses and had the Spirit of God dwelling on top over them, the Shekinah glory God. And they were eating and drinking supernatural food of the Old Covenant, the gifts from God, the manna and the water. They stumbled in the wilderness and died, and they never made it into the Promised Land. You read the book of Numbers, right? Only their children made it in. What did they stumble over throughout that time in the wilderness? They slipped back into the polytheism of Egypt while they were in the wilderness. So Paul warns them that while you think you're smart and you're strong and you got a clear conscience, you better think back to what happened to the people of God in the Old Covenant. God has brought you out of, the, out of Egypt, spiritual Egypt, right, the pagan world around you. He's baptized you into Jesus Christ. You are eating and drinking supernatural food and drink. That is the Eucharist. But you could stumble as well. How? Idolatry. And so he tells them, he says, look, verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, shun the worship of idols. But Paul, I'm not worshiping an idol. I told you that. I believe Zeus is no god. Yeah. But let me tell you what Zeus really is. I speak as the sensible men, right? You wise guys in Corinth. Judge for yourselves. You're smart, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I'm smart, Paul. Okay. The cup of blessing which we bless. Here's his rhetoric coming again. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? Well, yeah, Paul, of course. The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Of course. Yeah, these are rhetorical questions, right? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Oh, yeah, Paul, this is beautiful. Now you're talking, Paul. This is rhetoric. Keep going. Consider the practice of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar? Now, hold on, Paul. I see where you're going with this. Right, Paul's leading them into something. If you're eating and drinking the spiritual food and drink of the Christian community, and you're really participating, not just symbolically, but you're really participating in the real body of Christ. And if the ancient Israelites who ate of the sacrifices of the altar were made partners in the sacrifice, then what's, this, what's the conclusion? Then by eating the food offered to an idol, you are being made partners in the sacrifice. You're not just buying food and eating it. You are partners in that pagan sacrifice. Now, where is the hole in Paul's argument? And Paul knows where it is, at least in the mind of the Corinthians. Well, but Paul, Jesus is real. The God that the Israelites worship, he's real. But Zeus is no God. So your argument Paul's flat on his face, Paul. So look what he says. He anticipates them. He, he's a rhetorician himself. He says, what do I imply then? That food off to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, I agree with you. Zeus is no God. No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons. Right? This is right out of the book of Exodus, the Old Testament. The pagan gods, while Zeus is no God, Apis is not a god. Baal is not a god. Aphrodite is not a god. They are demons. Every pagan religion is demonic influence, trying to lead God's children away from the true faith in the one true God. And so the gods of the ancient world, the gods of today, the gods of the Pagan religions are not just false gods. They're demonic personalities behind every one of those gods. And so he says, I do not want you to be partners with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Right, that's from the book of Numbers, right? Like those fell back into idolatry. Are we stronger than he is? Verse 23. All things are lawful, Paul. Come on. Right? You know, that's what they're going to say. Look at the quote. All things are lawful. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. 
Let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. So he reminds them of his other argument against, you can't go to the temple of Zeus because not everyone's as smart as you. Yeah, I guess so. I can see that. Two, can't go to the temple of Zeus because, well, Zeus is not a god. He's a demon, and you don't want to be playing around demons. Bad idea. Might as well go get a, get a Ouija board. Verse 24, he says, let no one seek his own good but the good of his neighbor. Verse 25, eat whatever's sold in the meat market. Right? You want to eat meat? Fine. Go down to the market and buy the meat there. Don't go to the temple without raising any question on the grounds of conscience. So you don't have to worry about it. Don't go down there and ask, where did this come from? Was the guy a pagan? Did he butcher it properly? What? No. Go to the meat market. Go down there. You can buy your food. Okay? Fine. He says, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Right, your neighbor used to go over your neighbor's house. You know, your family go over there for a barbecue, but they notice you don't come over anymore. If your neighbor invites you over for a barbecue and you sit down and he says, "Eat whatever's put in front of you. Don't worry about it." He says, "And don't raise any questions on the ground of conscience." Fine. Verse twenty. But if one says to you, "This has been offered in sacrifice," then don't touch it. Why? Because for them, right? Lest they think that you are worshiping a pagan god, that you have slipped back into polytheism and have begun to weaken in your present monotheism. All right. So you see throughout 1 Corinthians this issue about the food and the drink and the prostitutes and also 1 Corinthians is a very strange letter if you don't understand this this context. But I want to conclude with where we began, uh, or where we ended our, our last section just before the break. And that's in chapter 15. In chapter 15, Paul spends a whole chapter trying to prove to the Corinthians that Jesus really bodily rose from the dead. And not only that, but that they too will be raised from the dead bodily. Why does he have to do this? Because of their dualism because of their dualism. And this is a good place then to conclude. It's not just the Corinthian dualism. That dualism that infected the Corinthian community is still around today. It's still around today. We have to begin to preach the gospel of Jesus again. Otherwise, our message has been deflated. How is our gospel message any different than any message of any other religion? Right? Oh, well, we, we worship Jesus. He's the leader of our faith. And it's through Jesus you'll be saved. So when I'll say, no, 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 it's Muhammad through Muhammad you'll be saved. So I'll say, no, no, it's through Buddha. And, or no, Confucius. Or no, it's Gandhi. Or who knows what. Or some modern, strange idea. There's cults popping up all over the place. What makes the Christian faith unique? It is this. Resurrection. Resurrection and the goodness of this material world and its need of restoration, not destruction. And this is why we celebrate every year and every Sunday and every day of our life, not only the resurrection of Jesus, but his eventual return when he will raise our mortal bodies from the dead and we will enter again back into the Garden of Eden with him by the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell with our loving Father for all eternity on earth with our bodies. For God's plan will not Peace worked. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is. He is risen. Thank you, Father Sebastian. A wonderful presentation. And honestly, I don't think we have to take questions because um, I think your application at the end is a is a great tool for all of us. Look, when we're going to be doing scripture study, to go back. 
context, context, context. And only then can we apply the scriptures to our, our spiritual life today, our moral life today, and so forth. And so I, I encourage you to really maybe go back and let's just talk again. But really, as, as Father Sebastian mentioned, more importantly, go back and read now Acts of the Apostles again and St. Paul's epistles, because like I said, like the title says, it's a key. Right? It's a key that unlocks. If we understand it in its proper context, then we're going to be able to apply it properly to our life, which is ultimately what we want to be able to gain from the scriptures. But we have to be able to understand how it was initially intended so as to properly apply it. So I hope you appreciated this, this series of, of, of talks. If you like what you're getting, number one, don't keep it to yourself. Help spread the word. Number two, please consider your support for the Institute of Catholic Culture because we do rely upon you uh, and, and so many others that give generously so as to make, ensure that we continue to do the work of Christ and do it as he intended, to do it freely, to present it. But to be able to do that, we have to have your support. So I ask you to prayerfully consider that. May God bless you all this evening, uh, and, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Father Sebastian, again for an excellent program. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.